the funny thing is for me even getting into gaming was an adventure in itself i i was gifted a copy of deus ex on pc and it turns out my pc could not run deus ex so at that time i had to find a gpu find a power supply and actually build a pc and this is in the early early 2000s okay and that's how i got in i think 2000 2002 yeah i got deus ex in 2002 the game came out in 2001 i was gifted a copy in 2002 i had to build a pc from ground up for that so that's how i actually got into it What's up guys we are back with episode 15 and today we have a guest we have a special guest unfortunately he couldn't have his camera on so we are going to have a picture of him there uh it's Rishi Alwani he's you guys most of you guys know him as the writer behind Marco Re- writer and co-founder behind Marco Reactor to me he's been a journalist gaming journalist for the longest time he's probably the first gaming journalist i found across twitter and in india um so, and of course joining me is udit as well what's up yeah. rishi thanks for having me this has been a long time coming happy yes. to be a part of this Yes, a long, long time coming. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, we'll get into it a little bit later. But uh, Rishi Alwani, right now, has uh, is also is the IGN India editor. So he's no longer with Marco Reactor. But we'll get into all of that uh, towards the end of the podcast, where we ask him how his journey has been and everything. But to start off with, okay, uh, Rishi. After we discuss all of this, I want to just mention. One thing I didn't mention in the topics list is towards the end of the podcast we will ask you what games are you playing and just ask your honest th- thoughts for whatever games okay sure sure take sure. it since this is a gaming podcast yeah <laughs> yeah sure um so yeah how did how have you been doing I'm doing great man um I'm spread a bit too thin but I'm happy to get back into the process of making content man it's been good I've been streaming Uh, I've been playing a lot of games, which is something I should have been doing, considering I'm a game designer. And so, yeah. <laughs> life's been a lot more nourishing. How you been? Yeah, I'm. I'm good too. I finally, I like picked up a game, uh, and I think usually it's the top game I've played since last year. And I've played some really good games, including Doom Eternal, and mm-hmm. one more I can't remember right now. But uh, yeah, Yakuza Seven completely. blew me away i don't know what to say it's like i wasn't expecting that to happen mm-hmm. when i picked up yakuza 7 it's 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 an rpg but it's like not a traditional western rpg that's a linear storyline everyone who anyone who's played jrpg games will know a yakuza games generally aren't very popular in this side of the world and on steam this particular game is not that popular either because it has like just 4000 reviews but yeah to me i think it's easily one of like if not the best game from last year one of the for sure because mm. to me it was the net definitive naruto and sasuke storyline but yeah we'll mm. get to all of that but let's get to our guests first so rishi you have been a gaming journalist or blogger for the longest time when how was the scene when you started and when did you start exactly because for as far as i know you've been around for almost two decades now Yeah okay so firstly let's get a few things clear i i don't consider myself a quote on quote journalist it's not like i'm stalking i mean staking scenes out and trying to get and you know trying to you know do something that's going to sh- change the world i'm just i'm just a guy who likes to write about video games and who's interested in the business of video games and how those things function and i try doing my best to make sure those aspects are reported uh, as accurately as possible without trying to get people fired that's essentially what i try to do um so yeah that that's what i that's what I, how i consider what i do um now so i've been writing on and off uh, about games yeah for that's accurate for a better part of two decades since i was in college uh and i used to freelance for a uh, for a for a magazine called JLT which was from the Times group I used to handle the games page over there that's while I was in college and uh, I also used to like uh, r- write for a bunch of places I mean one of the first places I ever published anything was this website called tbreak.com that's now I think I think now that got bought over or a few years ago that got bought over, bought over by IGN Middle East I'm, I could be wrong there but I I had a few stories written there also and uh, I actually started writing quote and quote professionally uh where I, i started getting my byline out there uh i think 
only in the last five years. So before that, I actually my first job was in game distribution and retail. I actually started working in you know, 2008, 2009, like almost 10 years ago at this point. And uh, I at my first job was at Milestone Interactive, where I was the product manager for EA, and uh, I I launched Game for You. I uh, was the guy who came up with India's first used game business model that was used at Game for You. Game for You was basically the Indian equivalent of GameStop. Mm-hmm. And so that's where I got my start. I got my start there. I under, and that's where I, you know, I, I came to understand some of the other parts of the business that aren't too well known, like, you know, what margin structures are, how distribution works, what games people actually buy and play in this country. So it's pretty cool. And uh, I, so, so that's where I got my start. And but uh, the writing came later. So I was there for a while. Then I was at Disney. Then I was at Square Enix. Disney? Um, yes. Mm-hmm. I was looking at uh, Disney's uh, Games on Demand service for India, which was basically at that time Game Pass, but for PC and before Game Pass was even a thing. So, Never uh, so heard that of was this. All... When was this? So this was around 2011, 2012, around that time. So uh, Games on Demand was basically a service where uh, if you paid, I think, what, 250 or 300 rupees a month, you'd get access to 100 plus games on PC. Uh, it, it died uh, soon after. Uh, and I, I mean, I, and by that time, I was already out. I think it died a year after I was out. So I, I was running that for a bit. And then I was at Square Enix uh, as a producer for one of their mobile games, which never happened. And uh, after all that, I started writing because uh, that was around 2014, and there weren't. Uh, two, and at that time, I was actually looking for a job in game dev. There weren't, and there was any. There wasn't anything worthwhile in game dev at the time. So I saw, an, I saw an opening at this place called Games in Asia. Uh, it seemed like a decent site. The content looked good. I applied. I got the job, and uh, I started writing there to begin with. Then I was at NDTV. I managed NDTV's gaming section for a better part of five years. Uh, you know, and it's that. That's where I really learned the ropes. You know. What, what needs to go into a story, what doesn't need to go into a story, what disclosure should be, uh, how, how to update stuff, how SEO works, the entire nine yards was, was basically there. And uh, so then after that, I was I started my own site, themakoreactor.com, and uh, we seemed to get our fair bit of notoriety on, based on our PS5 reporting in the country, which thankfully has been second to none. Um, <laughs> And along and along the way, uh, I got an offer to join IGN, and I took it. So I'm now editor at IGN India. So that's nice. how it. That's that's a that's, a, that's a huge. So I I don't I know a lot of people. I I think it's fair to say now that I know a lot of people in the Indian game industry, but I don't know in many people. I know like maybe three four people who have been in the gaming industry working like you have for the last two decades like or rather i should say who have as much experience as you but let me get this correct then you got into gaming again not journalism but you never had uh, formal training no i never did uh right. in fact the funny thing is for me even getting into gaming was an adventure in itself i i was gifted a copy of deus x on pc and it turns out my pc could not run deus x so at that time, I had to find a GPU, find a power supply, and actually build a PC. And this was in the early, early 2000s. Okay. And that's how I got into, I think, 2000, 2002. Yeah, I got Deus Ex in 2002. The game came out in 2001. I was gifted a copy in 2002. I had to build a PC from ground up for that. So that's how I actually got into it. I mean, I used to play stuff on and off. So how but old were you back then? The how, mood. how old were you back so then? I, think I was like 15, 16. Damn. So you got into gaming as uh, you got into blogging about gaming at the age of sixteen. No, that happened around the age of twenty. Okay, but yeah. this was so, this was in the year. This was uh, so the the blogging and so the blogging and the 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 stuff that would happen at uh, so GLT stuff was while I was in college, right? So that was right. around two thousand and. 2003 2004 around that time right uh, and and the actual published works only happened much later right okay w- wait what does that mean actual published work as in you know stuff like that are so bylines in places like mumbai mirror bylines in places like hindustan times right right uh, okay. by, bylines in places like the rolling stone and other places where i would do freelance that only happened much later right but that's still very early when uh, i'm guessing the game so i'm guessing you've seen the game industry for a much bigger chunk like time than most people in this country uh, most gamers yeah, have but... yeah mm. most, most gamers game, have most no, gamers most... have in general got, gotten into this industry in the last i would say 3 to 5 years alone right because um, mm. 
for india that's a very it's like a very new industry right how much would you say has changed in your eyes in the last how many years you've been around so it's an interesting thing that right? like three there are three ways to look at it right one way is from the industry standpoint and the industry standpoint i mean where see everyone seeing it first hand uh it's it's i mean from a pure numbers game it's a predominantly mobile market we we've all seen that uh, mm-hmm. and even, however while it's predominantly mobile i firmly believe that the actual revenue the actual return on investment is coming on other platforms not mobile but that's just my personal opinion on that uh and if we look at what's happening from a, from from a consumer standpoint it's it's a situation where yes a lot of we've seen a sudden burst of interest in the sector in the last 3 to 5 and a lot of that has to do with the fact that you know it's it's not that expensive to get into gaming at this point in time with the, with lower barriers of entry you have more people in that makes sense uh but when i look at it from a media perspective that's where things get interesting because uh there have been people who've been covering the scene way longer than i have there was jason lewis who who used to run uh, computer gaming world and then uh, moved on to mumbai mirror and then i think now is at midday he's still around doing some really good work uh there there used to be samir desai who handled mcv india and uh, and 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 runs ivg and then there's uh, there was even avinash bali avinash bali and some it was in fact one of the first and him and jason were some of the first cuz avinash used to run tech twos gaming section back in the day and then moved and then ran an ign india till i think 2017 so there have been people who've been covering it it's just that everyone has a different way or method of doing it and not everyone and i don't think any one of us have actually been quote unquote classically trained on how to cover the scene mm. uh, a lot of it's been a lot of it's been either based on what we're interested in or a lot of it's been based on what uh, we feel is necessary to cover so i don't th- i think outside of maybe one or two people like pranav dikshit who does stuff at buzzfeed and who who did probably one of the best reports on pubg's situation in india after the game got ban- uh, got banned and people got arrested in gujarat uh, a couple of years ago i don't think i th- outside of him i don't think there are too many quote unquote classically trained people who cover gaming in any shape or form so if i look at it from that standpoint uh the media aspect of it is where it's interesting because you have a ton of i mean youtube's made life exhausting for a lot of people where you have a lot of stuff that goes up there on the daily some of it good most of it bait for the lack of a better term and we're also seeing that on the written side right you have sites that crop up overnight gaming trying to juice seo game the system and get traffic make adsense money but put out stuff that doesn't make sense so you have all of that that keeps happening and uh that's where i see there's there's a huge up, there's a huge upside there uh, assuming you you know what you're doing there's a huge upside there as well right hmm so it's safe to say like a lot cha- uh, like changed over time but i am pretty it's pretty safe to also say that back like 15 years back i'm talking 2005 2010 uh like the industry wasn't built enough to have confidence of a full time job i'd say like at least if you weren't in a traditional sector like in directly in the game development side so what prompted you to continue and do you think like that assessment is correct like to say that i i it's much safer to have a job in gaming today than 15 years back you're not wrong that's i feel what you said is 100% correct because uh, at that time in that time period of let's say 2005 2010 or if you go back a bit more right assuming 2000 or 2010 and that's i think around the time you had india games you had mitashi edutainment you had uh, you had uh, uh, paradox and then you had uh, a bunch of other indian studios it was quite volatile i mean uh, i i mean from time to time i talked to people who who are from that era and they used to tell me that layoffs used to happen on the regular if a funding round wasn't if a funding round didn't happen if if there was a if there was a investor that pulled out it would be really bad and uh, and that that was on the core side of things so you can imagine how bad it would be for for someone on the media or, or on the mm-hmm. other part of the business so i think right now yes there is a greater sense of stability across the board it's not just stability for you know someone in the media or some or stability for people uh, marketing games for that matter or doing games pr there's even more stability for people in the core aspects of it like game design or or game development so i think uh, that if you ask me has been the it, it, it's it's a, it's i wouldn't say it's it's oh you're guaranteed job for life situation no but at least you're guaranteed i mean if you're competent enough you you're going to keep your job Right. So I think that's the big uh, that's the big difference and uh, I mean yeah you have other sectors of it right you see people doing stuff in esports you see people doing stuff in other aspects of the games business and uh, some of them 
continue to thrive, right? I mean, uh, if you ask me five years ago, would would a company like Nordwin uh, be acquired by Nazara? I would be like, hell no, that wouldn't happen. But that's happened, mm-hmm. right? And there are other and there are other uh, others in the works. You have esports club that's cropped up. You have Sky Esports. You got New Gen, who's also doing stuff. So, I do believe that right now it's in a. I'm not saying yeah, my industry greatest because it's not and. Uh, <laughs> And a lot, and a lot of it, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that there are literal asshats who think that gaming is equal to gambling. But that's another, and that's the problem with the success gaming has had, where you have some bad actors in the scene. But I'd say it's relatively stable to what it was years ago. But, but okay, like let's go back to what you just said. What do you mean, like uh, people who think gaming is gambling? Because think about it, right? You mm-hmm. have a situation where uh, where you have. Where, where there's a very concerned, concerted effort from a bunch of companies, you know, Dream Eleven, MPL, those sorts, who are trying to seem like they're gaming when they're mm-hmm. not, and mm-hmm. you can say you can see that, right? Like if you look at the Indian Game Developers Conference that's been happening, if you since I think 2018, we've had Dream Eleven, MPL, all these guys who actually do gambling or try to rebrand themselves as quote unquote uh, what uh, real money games. They've tried to encroach upon gaming. And uh, their sponsorship money, they, they use their sponsorship funds as a way to get legitimacy. And mm-hmm. to me, that's a problem because at the end of the day, uh, you have a larger audience who still isn't clear about what gaming is. Right. And when they see this as gaming, it becomes a problem. I mean, think about it, right? Today, uh, if you're like, like if you, we have a situation where ha- where most of these apps, right, they aren't even available in in a bunch of states because of law, because of legislation, because of laws that say that these are, this is basically gambling. And we have situations where people have lost a ton of money on gambling, but they want to be seen as gaming so as to soften the blow, so as to soften perception and so as to make them seem that they're fine and it's kosher and it's okay. And that is the problem with the success of gaming here is we've, we've invited the bad actors in and they're uh, looking to run away with it. Mm-hmm. That's something we've been trying to uh, bring attention to for the last five podcasts now, but... But uh, what I want to know, you'll have a better idea on this. Uh, recently, there was uh, there was issues regarding the same thing where I think a few apps got banned in Telangana uh, that yes. were around games, right? Uh, do you think there will be ad- like what's the what's the why? Uh, so, if for the common gamer, if you can explain why it should matter, right? Because uh, for industry specialists, I think it's easy to figure out why it matters. But why would someone why would Raju, who's sitting at home playing games and just wants to grow the gaming community in India, whether it's PUBG or PUBG Mobile or uh, PC gaming or console gaming, why should they care about what's happening in this side? Can you maybe... I'll that? tell you why. For one simple reason and one simple reason alone. Uh, tomorrow, all right, tomorrow, if the powers that be, if the regulations that are there, if the lawmakers that are there, if the policy makers are there, if the politicians in the government that's there, if in their head they start thinking gaming is equal to gambling, gaming is this teen, is this is this fantasy sports or teen party rummy where you're getting cash prizes, the moment they start thinking that, then if you think the bans are just going to be limited to things like PUBG, you're in for a rude awakening. It's gonna it's gonna impact other parts of the business. Mm-hmm. You're inviting regulation and legislation where it's not required. Mm-hmm. That is why everyone should care about this. It's a simple thing, right? You like it's it's like, think about it, right? When in college, there's a bunch, there's always a bunch of cool kids who everyone looks up to. And then there are the people who try to be like the cool kids and everyone knows their posers. And that's the problem right now. The posers are trying to, are running away with it. Essentially that. I, I have something to add. In this case, gambling apps are also like, or gambling, uh, the companies that make these gambling apps, they're also one of the few people bringing in money for investments and right. um, stuff in India. That's uh, I kind of disagree that? with that. I kind of disagree with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not just them. I mean, look at it this way, right? You, uh, if you like, for example, we have there are there are dedicated funds just for video games. That's been a thing for 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 almost like three like four months now. We've had Lumikai. That's just a dedicated fund for video games in India. You have Sequoia, Kalari, a bunch of these guys who want to make who want to invest in actual video games in India. Now. What, yes, these guys, right now it's a situation where a lot of these existing gambling companies are well-funded and well-heeled. That is correct. That's not wrong. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, if you look at it from a pure, from, from a pure uh, business perspective, and if you look at how those businesses work, naturally they need money 
because mm-hmm. look at it you're not available on the app store you're, you so when you and when you're not on the app store your cost of discovery becomes a lot higher mm-hmm. because your cost of discovery becomes a lot higher you're naturally going to ask for more investment from anyone who's going to put money into you right mm-hmm. so so that's one part of it you're, i mean if your business is in a gray area where you can't operate in 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 plain sight where you have to disguise yourself as uh you know real quote unquote real money games where you have to bombard uh journalists on the weekly call cold call journalists on the weekly saying if they if you'd want to interview them because hey we're quote unquote games of skill the costs are a lot higher way higher and that if you ask me is why they they have more money a lot of the money goes into make sure making sure that the image is seen as quote unquote gaming when it's not so that's it's why pretty much it's mm. a bubble mm. and it... and the moment legislation comes in the moment they 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 get their uh, the get the level of acceptance they want all that spend is going to stop mm. right it... so what do you like this is a very interesting scenario that i don't think a uh, lot of countries are in this situation uh, or uh, at least i don't like be, uh, and uh, even average gamers don't know what to compare with or what to do about it right because it's it's not, it seems something that's very far out of the average person's control or power, even reach to even ha- have any meaningful impact i would say but yeah it's Hmm. I mean yeah you're right from a from a quote unquote someone who plays video games perspective yes it's out of their reach but the problem is when you have the common man who gets exploited by these companies right. and uh, and 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 you I mean we keep seeing reports right mm-hmm. someone lost 30 40 lakhs on on playing this teen pati rami thing another mm-hmm. person lost so much other money and that's when you see the impact mm-hmm. and uh, that's where the problem lies it's it's it becomes a situation where uh it tarnishes the reputation of video games because of this because of the proximity this has to video games right and one day it's going to like mm-hmm. like you said if it's a bubble it's going to burst one day and the news are just going to cover it as video games right video games will be the one that'll be labeled on top of it and your parents are going to uh, speak to their children and be like hey see we told you don't get involved in these kind of things this kind of blanket label is what's it's, going to hurt. yeah and it's not just that it's also another question of uh like so i so a lot of game developers are are pretty cheesed off by by the state of affairs as well mm-hmm. uh one of them told me pretty much that uh yeah sure it's it's a good way to get investment in and all but then if, by that logic we should also be we should be making stuff that's illegal and make porn only then now that also gets good return on investment mm-hmm. why are we wasting our time doing this so mm-hmm. it's so the, the 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 developers themselves are pretty well aware and i won't be surprised if uh if you know if we end up seeing so and we're seeing parts of the industry talk up about this i mean we've seen uh, nordwin uh, i think akshar rathi in a recent interview with i think tequila of all places said straight up that uh, you know this is gambling and yeah and it's it's really it's it's shocking that he's done that because his parent company nazara does real money gaming yeah, so yeah, i'm that's like what i'm wondering I'm like, like what happened i'm like <laughs> i'm like mad prop son isn't like, isn't, you, 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 isn't akshar rathi in it, the board of nazara He is, and that's what I loved. I love the fact that he gives a shit. He gives enough okay. of a shit to take a stand, hmm. and that's principled as hell. I mean, hmm. I have my own, I have my own reservations with what Nordwin does on occasion, but this is good. Yeah. This is what people need to hear, hmm. and uh, it's not just him. Even Vishal Gondal has been saying a few things around this on Twitter as well, and it's just a matter of time before uh, you know things come to a head. So, hmm. I think it's it's good that the industry is you know aware of it, waking up to it. Hopefully, it means something. but i think the major concern and the major takeaway the community should have is that you don't see look games already has enough problems of its own all right we have to deal with loot boxes we have to deal with fut we have to deal with all sorts of nonsense that shouldn't have been there to begin with and things like this just make things worse they muddy the waters further than they already are so yeah hopefully we see that clear itself out right that was a deep rabbit hole we went in <laughs> yeah but but i think it's a nice conclusion fast conclusion to what we were searching for also but yeah it's a very interesting topic that we keep discussing in this podcast over and over again but the one thing between me and udit is we never know what to like like how to progress the topic because we have no control over something like that right uh, it's mm. it's we've seen um uh 
it, I mean, g- gambling is probably one of the latest problems that have cropped up in the Indian gaming scenario. Or it's been there, but it's been like reared its head up more so, I would say. But there have been a lot of yeah. other issues as well. Uh, something that I discussed with Udit, Udit and um, I think uh, Vaibhav was there from underdog studios in our podcast once we i discussed about how indian game developer conference for uh, for a good chunk period like around 2016 i remember uh, they were only discussing about how to make monet how to monetize your game rather than how to make a good game like they were talking only about iaps yeah, yeah, they, yeah. there's a reason for that also uh and i i know what Vaibha was talking about and he's not wrong mm-hmm. uh and and the reason for that is you know a lot of it is also driven by uh, the perceptions game, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's a huge see. There's a the the thought process from the quote unquote industry, and by the industry, I mean the people who've already made their money in the industry, is that uh, oh, if investors are coming in, investors should be putting if they have one million dollars to put put one million in ten studios, it makes for a bigger, better industry story that ten studios got funding, rather than putting one million into one studio. So. Mm-hmm. And and their logic is how do we make that happen? Oh, we can we should when we do the content around uh, our events, we should make sure it's focused on all the, you know, things that show that hey look the industry has progressed to the point where they only have to worry about you know monetization. And, <laughs> this thing. and it's also driven by publishers. It's also that's one part of it. Then the other part is the publishers because majority of the publishers in this country or any pub- publishers that operate not just in country in general the first two questions the developers are always what what's your monetization what's your retention strategy mm. they don't get they don't very few get into game design very few get into the weeds on how how you know how your stuff works but and i mean i'm guessing this problem exists because yeah you say uh, it first with it it's these two things that kind of influence game design in most of these companies. Right? Yeah, but then see, when you have a guy, when you have a guy who doesn't play video games, mm. all right, or when you have when you have someone on the publishing side who doesn't understand video games, who only looks at spreadsheets, who doesn't even know how to who doesn't even know how to sideload an app using test flight or you know any of that stuff, you can't expect him to to think about game design or core game loops. Totally agree. And that, that's what tends to happen. So. To me, it's just a situation where, and I know where Weber's coming from, right? Because I've seen this play out. He's not wrong. A lot no, of generally, it, around... it wasn't, by the way, I should just clarify. It wasn't Weber saying this. I was poking him to say it because this was an issue that I particularly covered in AssetCast back in the day, right? Where, yeah, so you know, yeah. you guys are, huh, so hmm. it's not wrong. The assessment isn't wrong. A lot of it has been driven uh, for, for for those aspects rather and that's what pisses me off because it shouldn't be about quote unquote monetization retention it should be actually being able to design games for free to play business models for business models that game developers may, developers may not traditionally be aware of mm-hmm. and that's uh, where you ask me the the bigger issue lies can you elaborate on that like for example right why why would you ra- like ra- rather than have a seminar on on how to monetize effectively? Mm-hmm. It would make sense to to rather to, to teach a develop to to give developers ideas on how to design for free to play games, mm-hmm. right? And there's a difference between the two. Rather than having a laser focus on different monetization methods or what monetization methods may may not work, make sense to to organically come up with the methods based on your design. And you'd only be able to get your get to a point where that's concerned if your game design is holistically made for that business model, right? Right. So that's that's where the issue lies. And I mean, if you look at it, right, some of the biggest biggest hits out of India, or which on 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 the Play Store and on the App Store from India, have been games which have a very straight line method in free to play, where it's basically retention equals monetization. As in, the longer people play, the more the greater chance they have of spending money. And those those two franchises that come to mind are, are uh, World Cricket Championship and Ludo King. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, no one and and the, the, I don't think and yeah, there there was real cricket also for a spell. So my point is, it's it's if that's the situation, right? Where these are the games that are making money and their their loops are pretty you know, chill. It's not like there's some dark science behind it, and oh no, no one else can crack it. No, it's a question. Oh, it's it's. Then 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 I believe that the discourse, the conversation that should be happening with devs should be on another level. They shouldn't be on just, you mm. know, one part of the business. Interesting. Um, yeah. I, Udit, do you have anything else to say on this? I think we discussed this as well, right? When we were talking about the Genshin Impact things, where yeah. it's like. I, where the best way, if you want to, if you want to make a good 
uh, good business. It's not as hard or it's not rocket science where you want to improve on your design to get money. It's like focus on retention. And if you develop goodwill among them, they will they will eventually spend. It's that simple. So I, I'm in agreement with uh, Rishi on that. Yeah, uh, this is completely off the segue. But uh, when when you say when you both and you and Rishi said like focus on retention and then you will get the money, you gave mm-hmm. Genshin Impact. The only other parallel I could think of is Raid Shadow Legend, <laughs> which has probably <laughs> zero retention. <laughs> but, but so here's the thing here's the thing there's also a huge asterisk to that right like uh retention is one part of it and the other part of it is also ensuring you have a steady flow of users coming in mm-hmm. and with genshin impact i mean look it's not uh, if you look at that game in particular it's pretty well polished mm-hmm. it's a game that that uh you know that you're available on multiple platforms you're yeah, not yeah. just on one platform and plus and there's a huge marketing spend attached to it as well yeah yeah so it's not just it's not just a question of putting it out there and oh people will come in. No, there's a, the the to get the people in is where the challenge is. Hmm. Uh, to get them to see what you have is where the challenge is, and hopefully the design sticks. And that's where, if you ask me, Genshin Impact is an interesting one because I mean they, they were featured on 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 every store they were on, including uh, PSN, and, and that's not easy to get. Right. Uh, there's a lot of wrangling for that to happen with uh, with platform holders to ensure it goes down properly. I, so I, I want to mention in BC, by the way, Genshin Impact mm-hmm. to barely got any um, uh, marketing like headway because it was not in Steam. It's not an Epic Store. It's not on any of exactly. the stores. It's on a website where you go there and separately download. So I I was pretty impressed that even despite that there were so many people playing on PC. There you go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, nice, so, nice topics. What? Right. Uh, wanted to move on uh, to the next topic where this was the most interesting to me because before, I think in 2010s, the most I got to, again, going back to the review cycle here, most of the reviews I'd read would be at columns on newspaper, right? But then there has been a lot of change in technology as well. And now we've completely shifted to digital things. Uh, I wanted to know how did that change the landscape of uh, covering games and, you know, uh, and the feedback from, uh, you know, your readers. And basically, how did that change the entire culture? So it's interesting because what used to happen was the reason why newspapers would get anything is had more to do with the fact that... Uh, Publishers uh, liked print because at that time they knew print was dying anyway. Mm. And any coverage in mainline, at least see, in India, even though it's dying internationally, in India the audiences were huge and huge. And for them, oh, it's reaching a new audience. So mm. that was their, that's why they were willing to give access to print to begin with. Mm. So there used to be, uh, so if I recall correctly, uh, certain games, right? Like uh, Re- Resident Evil 6, for example. Mm. Uh, the India reviews were f- was first on in new- in newspapers because mm-hmm. uh, they one codes were available like almost a, a month and a half before release and two right. publishers knew they'd get their uh, visibility and even with print right like uh, for example um, uh, when 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 chip used to be a thing chip would uh, chip would get early access to games mm-hmm. and that's because from a publisher standpoint oh print is uh, uh, print is you know it it looks good that's why we want it and. Now, yeah, that's changed over the years. Now it's a situation where I think uh, maybe outside of the Hindu and maybe outside of midday. Hello? Hello? More uh, stuff on print. Yeah, hello? Could you, could you repeat yeah. that? Maybe outside of Hindu? Yeah. Outside of, I think maybe outside of the Hindu and maybe outside of midday. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think maybe Deccan Chronicle. I don't think anyone else does anything on print anymore. I could be wrong. I mean, I haven't checked print in a Hindu, while. Hindu does gaming. Uh, yeah, 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 they have a they have, they have a game section and they do stuff. But point is, uh, now a lot of it has moved online for a reason, and that's because uh, see, it's it's also reached the point where uh, reviews. See, yes, reviews are important, but they're they're not gonna drive traffic. Mm-hmm. They're important. Yeah. But that's basically it. They don't drive traffic. Yeah. What's what what's important for for a publication is to ensure that you're on the ball, that you have the new, that you're also covering news, you're also doing features, you're also doing interviews. So that's where uh, th- there's been a change as well, right? So with the print, when it used to be print, there, you, you, your feedback loop would be, I mean, maybe one email or one letter from a reader and that was it. But because uh, you were on print and those are the limitations of the medium. You don't know how many people would actually read and all that. But mm-hmm. the moment it's gone online, 
you have you you have a ton of information on how to operate better you know what stories are doing better you know how to do better stories you know what's uh, you, you you know what the what, what readers want from you and uh, it becomes a more efficient uh, machine in my opinion you just and have more data think, overall if you're doing it online yeah and, yeah so so that's why we're seeing a surge right that's why there are a lot more stuff that just happens online because the feedback loop is faster quicker and it's more efficient in a lot of ways and i think uh, to me that's i think it's better this way simply because if you look at uh what's going down so there are two things right one newspapers still remain relevant but while newspapers remain relevant uh you also have uh, advertisers and you also you also have page counts now there's only so much news you can fit the limitation of the medium ensures that at best you'll only see a review maybe an interview if if it makes sense to put it but because of the limitations of the medium games coverage is is basically marginalized seven ways to sunday there used to be points in time where uh, if i recall correctly entire interviews would never make it in a newspaper is because of the lack of space mm-hmm. so so at the end of it i feel that games going online uh, has been fantastic it works you get to do more i mean i can't think of a situation where uh, where for example i think like so from what i remember back in the day uh for blizzcon blizzcon 2017 blizzcon 2017 is yeah i went for i think blizzcon 2017 and 2018 and those years blizzard was also thinking of getting print media along for the right mm. and i'm and i'm glad they didn't because uh those those two days at blizzcon i was doing like three interviews a day i got six interviews out of that one trip and that's not counting the news and everything else if they got print media in print media would probably give them a co- would probably give them a spread uh, that's it so two pages two pages of coverage out of six interviews seven interviews what's the point from a publisher standpoint you're not going to get your return on investment right you know so that kind of matters as well because access is i mean if your point is if you're a publisher and you want to give someone access you want to make sure they actually use it right otherwise what's the point right. so that's the other part of it that's uh, that where it gets fascinating because uh back in the day when traveling was a thing there were op- there were opportunities for back publications to go to gamescom <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean I don't see I don't see in a month. <laughs> so, you know, for like for example for E3 or for uh, for Gamescom or for or for any of the or Tokyo Game Show or whatever, uh the most print would ever give anyone is the spread two pages, maybe four if you're lucky. But if you're now that you're online, you can do a lot more. So, I mean when when we when 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 we did Gamescom at NDTV, I think we had like three stories a day minimum. and we got a lot of stories out of that so that's the advantage of being online you can do so much more that's not the case in print so so the uh, kind of medium right where most people yeah. to keep it with the short form but i realized i've seen back in the ndtv days you guys used to do podcasts which are like one hour to two hour segments right no 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 they were so transition was the the podcast was basically the start with was an hour long and we cut it down to 20 25 minutes uh, after the first 30 episodes or so mhm i think so, i was, yeah. i think i caught, i think i caught on to the early ones which are longer but yeah, yeah the that, earlier ones were longer yes 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 so that too again uh, forms it the thing right the freedom of the way you tackle your content which might work for some people for some people it might be like the shorter ones work there's the the flexibility again that you said is could you again uh, elaborate on the uh, podcast like but was that something that you initiated how did that come about this is an interesting one the podcast that at uh, i mean for those who are, who are listening in so ndtv used to have a gaming podcast called transition i think that ran for 120 120 episodes if i'm not mistaken there was basically three of us uh, pranay parab who's still on ndtv uh, mikhail madnani who runs meko reactor now and me at that time uh, so that that was something that came about around middle i think towards the end of 2016 where uh, we wanted to do a gaming podcast it was basically that prane comes up to me is like hey man let's do a gaming podcast and it was as simple as that literally and uh, it ended up doing really well i mean there, there were some episodes that i think have had over like a million plus listens which has been really cool to see so uh, that was the case of transition and uh, it was just a question of being consistent so we we only got so many episodes out because we were consistent about it we we only got to get to where we are because we are also paying attention to the metrics mm-hmm. it reached a point where we knew that people weren't listening for an hour straight it did make sense to keep it an hour long so we 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 shortened the length immediately and 
it was also a question of making sure it was discoverable. So we made sure that, you know, headlines were written in such a way that people would click through and listen, that, you know, it was in the right places where it would be, where necessary. So be it N4G, be it Reddit, wherever, we made sure it would go there. And uh, Touchwood, it ended up doing pretty well. But the only reason it did any good was because we were consistent. Mm-hmm. And we stuck to a schedule, do or die. Mm-hmm. So... I, I remember, I think, a couple of episodes I had recorded while I was on, on, on a junket. It, it reached that level where I'd actually carry a mic with me on, on trips so that in case it's a podcast recording day, I can record from wherever I am. So it was that level where we, you know, wanted to make sure it worked. And Pranay would do the same. Mike would do the same. We would all make sure that, yeah, it happens. And uh, yeah, if, uh, that's half the reason it, it worked, being consistent. The other half was... So the content where you try to make sure it was as relevant as possible. We wouldn't mm. deviate as much. And wherever possible, wherever we could provide context, uh, it would help people out. So that was the that was the entire logic there. I mean, the interesting part about your entire journey is like you ca- you came in with these kind of formats just before they actually started blowing up, right? Spotify wasn't a thing back then, you know, a lot of audio uh formats weren't much of a thing there. Now that if you want to distribute your uh, content on a podcast format can just do it in all these places, right? Was that uh, was that a struggle for you? No, because we never wanted to do put it on Spotify to begin with, uh, mm-hmm. because we weren't too confident on. That's the thing when a new platform comes in, everyone thinks it's all it's it's a bed of roses and it's going to be the best thing ever, and I'm going to get a billion views and I'm going to be like, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be the uh, the greatest overnight. No, it doesn't work that way because platforms in general have their own agenda mm-hmm. and the idea was to distribute it on our own site and our own platform our logic wasn't to 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 keep it on spotify at all and spotify did show up uh towards the end i think 2018 2019 spotify right. showed up but we didn't even want to put it on spotify then and even right now i don't think any of the gad- uh, any of the gadgets 360 slash ntv gadgets podcasts are on spotify either i'm not sure but last i checked they weren't so the logic was to basically create uh, our own our own little piece of uh, paradise and that is where the challenge lies. It, it isn't a question of, oh, okay, just put it on Spotify. Because see, the moment you do stuff like that, you don't want to lose control, right? Mm-hmm. So why do that? And uh, we've seen that, right? Name one platform that's actually helped media grow. It's yeah. reached a point where Apple yes. News, it's reached a point where no one wants to support Apple News because no publisher is making revenue. No no news media publisher is making revenue from Apple News. Yeah. We reached a point where where uh, Spotify's terms and conditions are so bad that they, that certain podcast creators are t- are turning their backs on the platform altogether. Mm. And mm-hmm. we're saying, and look at YouTube. YouTube's no better. Mm. YouTube has similar situations. And so when you when you kind of understand how platforms operate, you, you you're gonna you're gonna end up taking at least we felt it made sense to take an approach that wasn't dependent on any of them because I mean everyone saw what happened to college humor in Dorkley, right they put all their money on Facebook and look where it got them mm-hmm. so for us it is a question of growing our own our own our own sections our own properties without have, without dependence on on third parties and that for us was the bigger draw than anything else how did you do the research about distribution because I think that's one of the for creators. Like, uh, I think in general, for creators in India today, uh, because so many of uh, them, like, whether it be YouTube, whether it be bloggers, whether it be anyone who is creating content on the internet, their first problem that they come across, the barrier they come across is, how do I distribute or how do I market my uh, content? And you guys seem to have done a phenomenal job, like, amazing job everywhere, like, uh, from, you've done... I, I I've been following IVG. I've been following Marco Reactor. I've been following uh, NDTV gadgets. So NDTV gadgets, I would say, had uh, backing on its own, like in a ways, right? But how would you suggest, like, for these content creators, uh, what are the tips or tricks you would say for distribution of their content? So, so the thing is, I look at it this way, right? Um, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, one is obviously consistency. Whatever you're doing, make sure you're doing it regularly to begin with. Uh, once you have a regular pipeline of content that keeps coming through, the next thing that's important is ensuring you have that you know how each platform operates. So, for example, we would never touch Reddit with a 10-foot pole. And one simple what? reason is we don't want... Simple, we don't want to get shadow banned. We can't be seen self-promoting, right? Right, right. Why should... 
so 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 for reddit the challenge was was very simple it was wasn't a question was to make sure we didn't get shadow banned we followed the rules to the letter so mm. if we had to post anything on reddit it would basically be we would actually it would literally be participation for a, for a couple of days then only or even a week if need be then only ask the mod hey can we post this it's self promotion and if we got the approval then only otherwise we would not touch it with a 10 foot pole because we don't mm. want the domain to be shadow banned and i am very very particular about this because games in asia the only reason games in asia died is because we we went rampant on reddit a site that was doing 2 million a million 2 million hits a month went down to a third a third of that overnight because we got shadow banned from reddit hmm hmm yeah so so i so where reddit is concerned you play by the rules or don't play uh on n4g yeah n4g if it made sense to put it there again follow the rules and put it there and with n4g the rules are a little more uh, a little are a little more nuanced where uh, certain things have to be labeled as opinion pieces even though they're reviews etc 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 so see here's a, here's a story hardware, here's a story i'll tell yeah. you from our side take huh? it Uh, we got banned. <laughs> this is our story, our experience. We got banned from N4G. Guess why? <laughs> why? Joel woke up. Uh, Joel fought one of the mods. <laughs> yeah, well, you don't. That's the thing. You don't fight the mods. Huh? They're, they're the yeah. ones running the show. <laughs> but but yeah, that's when you when you said like don't get shadow banned and stuff. So we were also starting out, right? We didn't know. But I I didn't I knew don't fight with the mods it's like a common sense mm-hmm. technique but apparently some of us didn't know and we got banned out of um we got shadow banned as well but I don't believe our domain ever got shadow banned I believe like someone in us got shadow banned and we never saw that we got shadow banned and later on we started posting from another account and they still accepted us but yeah yeah Our rules are very definitely important over the years that something we learned and mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, for so that's another thing, right? Making sure that whatever platform you're distributing on, you play by the rules or don't play. Mm-hmm. And more often than not, and more often than not, you'll see the traction. It's not going to happen overnight. It'll happen over a period of three, four, five pieces of content or stories you put up. Otherwise, you know, it's not going to. So so that's the main thing. And aside from that, is uh, also a question of uh, so so you is 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 your social media game. So like for us, it's. if it's news or if it's something that's important just post it immediately there's no point waiting on it mm-hmm. and uh, and and we just do the basics to be honest and getting the basics right is half of it well, if you get it right at the right time chances are it'll be picked up by someone else right and, and you guys when, are very different you guys are very different also compared to other um uh when i say you guys i specifically mean how you did it with marco reactor uh whereas you only focused on twitter if i'm correct Yeah, with with that we focused on Twitter because we didn't have time. We only had two people. Why right. why would we focus on platforms where we don't have time to bother with? Right. And with Mako and with Mako, it wasn't just a question of Twitter. It was also just a it was also a question of having stuff that no one else had. Mm. So part of the job is to speak to people, and uh, we make sure we speak to people on the regular so that the information is different and is better. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's that that's the other part of it, right? So, right. Together. That's how it would be. I mean, mm-hmm. the idea is differentiation where necessary. So, right. and again, with us, look, the 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 mandate was different to begin with. It was only focusing on Japanese games and and the Indian games industry. We weren't focusing on everything in their granddad. If it was right. everything in their granddad, it would require a different strategy altogether, right? So, right. yeah, it's just a question of playing to your editorial strengths also. Okay. So, Now this so is. Yeah. Where, where? Because I want, I, I want to talk about this part because two twenty eighteen or something. I think Aman and I were having a drink, right, uh, at a place, and Aman was like, "Hey, do you know Rishi? He started a new website where he covers Japanese games." And I choked my drink right there, <laughs> like because Aman might have known you, but I had no idea. And I'm like, this came out of the left field. I didn't know this guy was a huge geek. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. Rishi, now you have to answer us. How are you such a weeb? And since when was this a thing? Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Ah, uh, I think I think I started with Final Fantasy VII. Okay, explains. Yeah. The name explains. And uh, that, and when, and uh, watching copious amounts of Robotech when that was on Star World, Robotech, which yeah. then, 
then I found out that it was actually Macross. Then I started watching Macross Zero Frontier and the good stuff. I'm so old. yeah. So do you, do you still watch anime? Uh, on occasion, whenever I have the time. I mean, right now, like the last thing I watched at all was the last episode of Mandalorian, and I'm like, I want my time in. I want my time back. This is such a. That's not Mandalorian. Is not anime. I know it's not, but it's just annoying that because that's the last thing I watched, and I wish I didn't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So okay. yeah. One annoying question, and then we move on to the real ones. Have you watched One Piece? No, I've heard a lot of it. I'm, <laughs> a lot of my friends swear by One Piece like it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, and I'm like, okay. So, yes. Okay. It is. I mean, haven't watched it yet. I, I wish one day uh, there will be a game that justifies the anime. But yeah, let's continue. Marco Reactor, please tell us the story about that. It's obvious that you are. The name is inspired from Final Fantasy VII. Um, you said towards after NDV gadgets, you founded Marco Reactor. How did you go about it? Like, what's the idea behind only covering Japanese games in India? And is there even a sector of people who play Japanese games in India? Which is an interesting question. I think you will be the best person to answer that. So, yeah. So, okay, so for the first part of your question, uh, the so we the thing is, Mike and I had the domain since 2013. Okay. Uh, the idea, the idea was it was actually just supposed to be uh, a news site where we just uh, sell link to everyone else and and uh, just just cover third, I just cover news from everyone else. That was literally what it was supposed to be. Uh, we sat on the domain and uh, we bought, we got the domain after I got laid off from Square Enix. I'm like, yeah, we'll do this, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, but at the same time, hey, take your Marco Reactor domain. <laughs> I mean, we bought the domain was available. We bought it. Simple as that. <laughs> And, uh, so, so that's how the site started. We had it since 2013. We only we only went live with it in uh, 2020. So, right. so because uh, what happened after that, I joined Games in Asia. Then I was at NDTV. So we never acted on it. So we started the site last year. Uh, the first thing we ever put up was, uh, I mean, the first thing we published on the day was our preview of Judgment because Sega was kind enough to give us access, mm-hmm. um, and it was it's been doing it was doing phenomenally well. I think uh, to be honest, the numbers we've achieved in the last year and a half, I did not expect us to get mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there is an audience that cares. There's an audience that reads. There's an audience that keeps coming back, and. Uh, Hopefully, Mike will be able to take it to the next level. Hmm. I, I want some data if you help help, but like any anything vague will also help. Like, would you say there are million people playing JRPG games in India, or at least interested in JRPG games in India? What is that number like? So, I don't. So the thing is, I I wouldn't say I don't know. I wouldn't even go to the extent of considering a pure numbers play here because if I break it down by platform. Do we even have a million PCs that can play games in general? Is a big question. First, I mean, that's 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 how I look at it, right? And if we look at the math on platforms, right? I think hmm. what uh, we're probably we I think at 450k PS4s, 50 roughly 50 55k Xbox Ones, not counting Series X, Series S yet, because I don't know the exact numbers. Uh, then if we look at PC, maybe a million best case. Hmm. Now, if your total addressable audience outside of mobile is Maybe optimistically, and assuming grey, assuming everything is maybe one and a half, two million, is uh, potential people who are willing to pay to play games. I'm not talking pirates here. Then uh, how much of that will be JRPGs? I that's an interesting one. I can't. I I don't know. I really don't know. Is I would it... say that all I would say is that mm-hmm. the numbers are enough to justify running this site. Right. Lovely. But but have you yeah. come across like? Um... What I mean to say is, like, have you come across like a people say, say for example, uh, Final Fantasy for fifteen uh, can technically be said uh, JRPG, right? No, or oh, no, fourteen yeah, is the MMO. Fourteen is an MMO, right? Fourteen is yeah, the MMO. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Would you say there is like a so is there like a good base of people who play it in India? I'm I'm not sure. So honestly, FF fourteen being an MMO, I don't think has a great base here for the simple reason is. The subscription. I mean, yeah. Now it's basically free till the level, so that's mm-hmm. fine. Mm-hmm. But I don't think too many people. So even at Mako, we never covered it. Covered it too much. Right. So, with the single player stuff is what we focused on because right. that's where we the single player Final Fantasy games, from a visibility standpoint, made more sense. 
Hmm. Right, but so it's so it's such a happen. it's such a definitive niche. It's like you only already said, right? According to you, there's like almost like all ba- barely a million uh, PC gamers. Uh, there's four fifty k PS fours and fifty five k Xboxes, right? Last generation, and yeah. I, I'm just finding it very weird that you take all of that data and you knew about most of these data before you started Mirko React, and then you decide to start like a very niche JRPG site. Like, wh- what gave you that confidence? Is what my curiosity is. Like, you were so, very confident about. Honestly, it's a it was it is a mix of two things. One, we like we like our Japanese games, so we went ahead with it. That was one thing. The second thing is, come on, it's a site which is being run by two people. All right. Hmm. If 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 we if we wanted to do justice to the entire ecosystem, we would need at least a team of five, four to five minimum, right? And that would and that by with a team of three, four people, maybe we would be able to cover everything else. Maybe we'd be able to cover PUBG. Maybe we'd be able to cover Fortnite. Maybe we'd cover cover COD. Maybe we'd be able to cover E3. Do a live blog. Do it regularly. But when you only have a team of two, you pick your battles, right? So for us, we picked our battles on what we were confident in. Really? Simple as that. I really love how you know your limitations defined your niche, and your niche kind of brought you your uh, a success in its own way, which made you unique, right? So it's a very very interesting approach the way it's gone. You also Because for us, it wasn't. It was never a question of. See, for us, it's so the thing is the numbers we knew were going to be minuscule in terms of quote unquote people playing games. Hmm. We knew that, but we knew that we had a chance because one, we are confident about what we're putting out there, and two, I mean, it's been underserved, man. At the end of the day, hmm. when you have thirty, when you have like what fifty hundred sites in India that are just basically going to cover every PUBG ban, hmm. you need some someone will someone's bound to like do something different, and that'll catch on. So that was the that was the that was the logic, and it's it's nice to see that. That actually worked, mm-hmm. so that's what I think was was heartening more than anything else. Really, yeah, I agree completely. Yeah, I I think you also gave hope to other people for content creators. I I think people in India believe that if they are not making mainstream mainstream content, they will not grow. But I think there is a separate way, and focusing on a specific niche can also help. I think that something we also achieved with Asset Cast back in the day, uh, when we focused down on our particular niches and whatever we were good at, we were getting a lot more viewers than when we were just covering mainstream news. Yeah. Um, moving on um, to one of the main topic of discussion for the day, and the last one is now your IGN India editor. Please tell us more about that. Uh, okay, yeah. before before we begin, I will just give you my perspective. I opened Asset Cast in two thousand thirteen. IGN India, I think I believe it came out in two thousand thirteen end. Uh, and since then, IGN India has been in like a, I I don't know some su- su- suspended animation kind of state where they grew in the first six months and then they stayed. Exactly where they are. Correct me if I'm wrong. So look, I don't know about. So the thing is, mm-hmm. IGN India, from what I know, started in twenty around twenty twelve, twenty thirteen in that time frame. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, it was so at that time. You know, I don't. I I can't even speak for the people who were there because they had their own agenda. They had their own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but to me, so what happened in my what what happened with with me and my and how I got there was so. They 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 had an opening and I applied and I I got the job. That was literally it. Mm-hmm. There was no there was, there was no rocket science. There it was sort of surprisingly straightforward. Two interview rounds and that was it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that's what happened. Now as for it being, in, I don't know. I don't think it's a question of suspended animation. Uh, it has more to do with the fact that they had. I guess again, I can't speak for the guys who who were running it then because they're not there anymore. Mm-hmm. Is A lot has changed, right? It's come under different management now. Also, uh, before it was under, it, it started under Times Internet, and now it's with Fork Media. It's with a different company, so I can't speak to what's happened with all of that. But what I will say is that um, I think that there's a need to ensure that you know you got like if in order for the scene to have any sense of legitimacy, in order for the scene to actually have any sense of sticking out, you know, of of breaking through, uh, you need. I mean, brands like IGN are important. 
they need to because because you're because because you're able to cross go across right you're able to cross that barrier be, 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 between you know mainstream newspaper and co- and content creator you you you're in that you're right in the zone in between those two and i think that's necessary it's just a question of making sure that what's what's out there and what's put there is relevant mm-hmm. and uh, i think we'll have to see how that priority plays out so far i mean so far touchwood uh we've been able to bring the same level of uh, of of uh, reporting on 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 what's important here for indians right uh so far we've been able to do that but let's see how we're able to continue it and take it to the next level so i think that's what the what's going to be important with this more than anything else right so uh, so just to give people an understanding since i i have a lot of people who might not know about igen as well which is surprising but it can always happen but igen is very internationally famous right igen is uh, igen us is probably the top out there in terms of where you get your gaming information from uh, in general no matter where you are in the world some of the t- best like some of the most early news about most of the games like 90% of the games out in the market come from igen uh, us and in terms I, of media it's a giant Just in terms of what in terms of pure media even movies and everything it's yeah, a, it's a yeah, giant yeah even in terms of movies which is interesting that you bring that up i, I didn't think about it but igen is also available in dubai which i know is very big and then you, you europe igen uh, where they're in uk and stuff which is big do you think like um it it didn't happen in the last 7 years do you think igen is finally taking that kind of interest in india where they want to scale up to that level because india definitely has that kind of a consumer base we have been seeing for example i i have friends working in places like free fire uh, grena and other places right and mobile market in right now in india is getting viewership that's insane like just like that's the word i can say because udit you might not know this free fire is a game that in india gets 750k concurrent viewers right that's concurrent viewers like that's higher than some e3 manages to get at some points right which is insane when you just think about it and it's just people from india so do you think rishi is is igen finally taking that kind of interest is is this like an expansion where you guys will also be putting out um stuff like video daily fix maybe or you know um hosting uh uh different kinds of video shows that igen generally does what's what's the future there and is is it like the golden age of journalism is coming finally need okay i'm exaggerating but you get the point honestly it's too early to tell mm-hmm. uh i I'll then I'll tell you why because at the end of the day uh for example right I mean as you said free fire is doing so and so numbers that's great but mm-hmm. at the end of it what what what's always worried me hasn't been the numbers mm-hmm. I mean the numbers are important and they they're useful they help you guide on what you're supposed to do next that's great but what worries me uh is the is also the quality of audience that's coming in mm-hmm. because I mean let's be honest man uh at the end of the day if I look at it from a pure business standpoint if i look at any any publication that's operating from a pure business standpoint if if uh, if the brands if sponsors if people who 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 are trying to you know uh get are trying to basically spend money in gaming and in the gaming space what worries me in these situations is the first thing they're going to do is look at the audience they're going to see okay 750k is great but what kind of people are there are these people who actually have money to spend or are these people who are just you know playing for free because they don't have the money and that's what worries me sometimes is because a lot of people tend to equate the numbers with an audience that can pay hmm. and that's not the case yes the, the law of probability does kick in after a point at scale the law of probability will kick in where you will monetize on a audience large enough but for a country like india with our population is that number 750k concurrent on a on a free fire stream i am not sure uh that's how i would view what what you're talking about now as for us and our editorial plans uh it's going to be an interesting one where it's it all i'll have to say is stay tuned i mean there's nothing to there's nothing to say right now it's pretty mm. much stay tuned yeah so, so when do we see your yeah. first articles or when do we see the operations at least start for igen india under you it's already started happening since last week okay <laughs> no i'm just yeah we've been so Uh, I I joined last week and I we've already been 
I, I mean, I've already been overseeing what's happening, and I've been already posting by myself as well. So but stuff's no, already been happening. But barely people know. Here's the thing: you, are, whether you want to call yourself an influencer or not, that doesn't matter. But for most gamers across India. Uh, who follow you you're already a big influencer and i think what you say uh what your opinions are about games and and this is where i think uh, it matters most influencers in india are just at least gaming influencers in india are just about selling you gaming hardware whereas they don't have a lot of strong opinions about games themselves unless it's about pubg mobile or mainstream stuff whereas you are more of a reviewer i would say and you are along the lines of someone someone like manas who has strong opinions about games and when you say it people gen- tend to listen so yeah it's 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 going to be interesting seeing uh more editorial because you people still don't know that you're IGN India editor is that it? I'm pretty sure that's accurate if i say that I mean <laughs> look man whoever has been following me on twitter they can probably see that all i've been doing for most of last week has been posting links to stories from there so now right. <laughs> if they can now if i have to like go paint it or uh, paint it on a hoarding or something that like, why should i do that i mean people will find it and and honestly speaking honestly speaking uh the focus while while yes i do have my own strong opinions on the scene that's mm-hmm. to start with that's not the focus to start with the focus is keeping people informed on what's happening Right. and if i look at it that's to me at this point in time more important than my own personal opinions because i mean look we're in a situation where uh what's who's most likely the most profitable console uh, uh, sorry most profitable games company or at least the company that's making money or like sony isn't saying anything on the ps5 and what's necessary mm-hmm. so where so which is why most of last week has been me doubling down on what's important for people to know and that's where where where, where my focus has been right so like the, the like the digital edition of the ps5 is not coming in God sony finally confirmed yeah. that Yeah and also and, some of uh, the accessories aren't coming in as well. Yeah, accessories aren't coming in. And then Amazon Amazon's made it clear that the uh, their uh, PS5 pre-orders aren't going to be exclusive to Prime members and they won't be they won't be forcing bundles down your throat, which is what other other distrib- other so other stores seem to be doing. So the idea is to more than anything else make sure people know what's going on, be relevant to them and mm-hmm. then we take life from there. So that's what's already been happening, that's been the focus so far and we'll see where it goes. So it, okay I, i know you already said this but is it's been mostly written content is there going to be video content uh let's see because the problem with with i mean the while why would be great to be to get working in a studio and get things running with pro, with proper tech and production values we i mean i don't know how that's going to work out because i mean i've just joined a week ago i need to figure that out so mm-hmm. let's see okay okay theek hai So last segment of the podcast I think uh, other uh, do you have anything else to you know him about IG in India No no, no. okay <laughs> then then last the last part of the podcast which I think you know uh Rishi what games have you been playing this week Uh so that's a good one I finished Call of the Sea That was Call really good That was really yes okay. yeah Call of the Sea That's a first person adventure puzzle game. It's pretty good. Uh really 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 cool game, really cool narrative. Very very uh, Lovecraftian with some mm-hmm. really really cool animations. I really like the way you transition and animate in certain parts of it. That's been really nice. Been playing that. Been, I finished off the Hive Busters uh, Gears 5 campaign. That was also really cool. Uh very it was really nice and really a good self-contained story. How, I just wish there was more that? of it. How big is Three that? Three hours. Okay. Hours. Yeah, I heard that came out. It's also free on Xbox Pass Unlimited, if I'm um, correct. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. It's a, it's, it's there also. So, I've been playing that. That was also pretty good. Uh, and I've been playing a lot of Dragon Quest XI, uh, Definitive Edition. After so, Yakuza Seven. Yes. So I've been playing a lot of Dragon Quest also. That's been really, really good. I actually. Uh, sorry it's actually called Dragon Quest 11 S Echoes of an Elusive Age different yeah, edition. Yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> so yeah that's what I've been playing that's really good. Uh mm. I like where that's going. It's it's basically comfort food JRPG. I like right. it. So, is, yeah that's when I streamed it that's exactly what I said. It's like it doesn't do anything uh, out of the ordinary but it always feels like you know you've gone to your grandma's place. You know it just yeah, yeah, yeah. gives all the boxes that you wanted out of a JRPG. Right? It's yep. just mm. yep. as So so basically that yeah So Rishi 2021 by what are your top 3 games from 2020 And why oh, is it wait, so- Top 3 yeah. Top 3 games of 2020 Yeah 
Uh, okay, I'd say Resident Evil 3, Persona 5 Royal, uh, and Final Fantasy 7 Remake. Persona Final Fantasy 7, oh my god. All, all PS, uh, like, two, out of the three games, the two of them are PS exclusive for the moment. I don't look at it that way. I don't look at it that way. I just go where the games are. So. No, yeah, for sure. Uh, I don't play horror games, so I can't touch Resident Evil. I am mm. very scared. But yeah. 3 is more oriented though. You should try it. Which is? Yep. Three is more action oriented. Uh, yeah, three. yeah. Okay, yep. okay. I'll I'll try. What have you been playing with it? All right. So uh, I'll let you cover the game uh, that uh, I want to talk because you can guess on it more. This is a game that I think uh, I think Rishi might have played it. If not, it would be of huge interest to him. Uh, it's an indie game that one of my friends uh, brought to my attention. It's called Knights and Bikes. Uh, oh no, I haven't. I haven't. We'll check it out. Oh uh, yeah. So uh, the uh, I went to the page. Uh, webs, uh, its website and the inspiration was Rishi, you're gonna love this. It was like we wanted to mash Secret of Mana with the Goonies. Okay. Nice. Oh yeah, nice. this is the, this is published by Double Fine. Yeah, yeah. Heard yes, this one. it's published by Double Fine and the people who were they were former Media Molecule staff, right? And nice. that's immediately apparent with the art style. The art style is straight up tear away, right? If for those of people who don't know, it's like it feels like a storyboard. A three-dimensional storyboard with cutouts, right? Where people yeah, are yeah, yeah. So it's imme- and immediately the game starts, and it starts with this really cool montage of these people riding on a bike and this amazing music playing. And I was like, "Who is the music comp- composer? I need to know." And the name Daniel Pemberton comes on the screen. I'm like, "Yes!" For those people who don't know, Daniel Pemberton composed the music for Spider Verse, right? So I was immediately hyped, right? So Aman. The thing mm. is, uh, this is a co-op game, a story-based co-op game, okay? Mm. Uh, in much in the way of A Way Out. Uh, and, you know, you have these two characters. One is Nessa, uh, who is this small town uh, girl. Uh, and the other one is, uh, what her name? But she's the uptown girl. She's pre- you can immediately tell she's like the rich white person because she keeps talking about golf for some reason. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but they are going through some eviction notice. Uh, her her family is going through a tough time, and you're navigating around this uh, around this place. And you know she keeps talking about these Arthurian uh, Arthurian legends and stuff like that. You know, and talk about how knights used to live in this place. So they visualize everything as you know uh, actual knight battles and stuff. And you know, Secret of Mana was actually one of the action based uh, uh, RPGs. So in this. It's again an action RPG, but it's very unique in that it's not like you're going with swords or anything, right? Uh, Nessa has, a, 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 I think it's a, a disc that she keeps throwing at people. So she's the long range person, right? And mm. uh, uh, the other girl uh, has boots, right? Which she can use to stomp uh, and, you know, uh, do, uh, do really, really heavy damage. And you can combine the two. You can throw the disc on the other person. That person can kick and it can hit the bosses and stuff many creative ways right it is just such so well designed and um, uh, one of the things i want to tell you it's set in the 80s because the goonies were set in the 80s and what it does well which i think most of the throwbacks to 80s are going wrong uh, is that most of the other games are going too heavy on the aesthetic you know the synth wave aesthetic uh, which but this one really gets the essence when it says that we are inspired by the goonies or you know uh, the John Hughes movies, they really stick in because it actually gets that. the That age was always about this teenage angst, you know, uh, about these suburban kids. And it really, really gets that vibe of these people just finding their place, right? And the aesthetic, definitely, you do have that, uh, uh, the 80s vibe coming up here and there, but it feels very genuine, way more than something like Stranger Things. And mm-hmm. Really, you're going to love this game. I'm telling you, this is like straight up condition for you. So I, I saw you streaming the game, I think, on YouTube. Uh, the aesthetic was nice, but I think I'm sold out as soon as you said it's published by Double Fine. Because I, right. I personally trust Tim Schafer. Like if he's, put, if, yeah, if he's putting out something, I will generally check it out because he's that kind of a guy. And mm-hmm. I, I am really, really excited for upcoming games by Double Fine, specifically Psychonauts 2, which is something they've been making for lo- some time now and looks like an acid trip. But I, I, I finished Yakuza 7. 
You right. remember? You remember? I play. I was playing Death Stranding, and I was, I told you Death Stranding is the experience I wanted from Cyberpunk because Cyberpunk didn't really, um, like it, mm. it. It it was nice. I won't say it's a bad game, by any means, but it felt like uh, Cyberpunk felt like there was a lot of potential that it could never get across, right? Um, mm. From gameplay design to storytelling to everything, uh, I. I uh, for people who have played, there's so many points in the game that I can personally recall where I thought you would have a much bigger payoff. And then there is a payoff, but it's it's more on the dialogue side rather than bombastic action style. And which makes me wonder where exactly the budget like went for um, a lot of the visual design. Because a lot, like something that people have pointed out, the visual design is very static. And then I mm. came across um, Death Stranding. It had a story. It had... A very weird story. <laughs> it's something going on, <laughs> and uh, the gameplay was very innovative, and the music just blew me away. And of course, it was optimized. And then I played Yakuza Seven, and I immediately forgot about everything else. Right from the beginning mm. to I just finished it yesterday to the end. Mm. Um, mm. It's it's such a great game. It's easily my top grade uh, top game from 2020 at this point because. Uh, when I think of games from 2020, the the most uh, the the second game I can think of for myself is Doom Eternal, which mm. I thought was very innovative in how it tackled the gunplay and everything. But the mm. story for me like took went down a notch in some mm. cases, specifically from Doom 2016. But overall, mm. still great game. This was such a breath of fresh air because first of all, I've played Dragon Quest Builders too. Right, hmm. so I I got all the references that Ichiban was saying throughout the game. It's like Dragon Quest, and then I saw that they aren't just saying it's Dragon Quest. They literally built it up, ground up, like Dragon Quest. From and I I haven't for those of you looking at the uh, watching this podcast, I haven't played the previous Yakuza games. I have just a very faint idea about what they're like, but uh, I am told that they have similar level design, similar. Uh, uh, what should I say? Storytelling? But even amongst people who have played Yakuza games, apparently this is one of the best stories. And from what I can tell, I prefer Ichiban as a protagonist than I would Kiryu. Because he just reminds like from get-go, from the starting, I was like, he's Naruto. Right. <laughs> and, right. and that, I, I don't know what, what uh, the or- inten- original intention was for this game but it ends like naruto as well <laughs> right? right and it's a very optimistic story with a lot right. of um despite a lot of hardships going on in the protagonist's life i won't spoil anything because i think the uh, story is absolutely beautiful but yeah yakuza 7 you guys should definitely play it and what what got me like I think some 10 hours into the game or 8 hours into the game, there's a moment, and that's this is not a spoiler because it's in the trailer, where Ichiban mm. finds a baseball bat struck to the ground, and he picks that up. It's like an, he makes it seem like it's the Excalibur sword from Arthur. And mm. because he picks it up, he has uh, he gets a job class, which is basically a... Mm. How should I say this? Class system? Which is, right. It, it, this game also has class system, right? But in, in yeah. basic JRPG games, you would have stuff like soldier, like or mm. melee, and then you would have archer, you would have mage, you would have uh, uh, someone who's a bard. Similar mm. class structures exist here, but they're named differently. For example, there's like a freelancer, which is like a boxer. Then there's a hero, which is someone pretending, like Ichiban basically pretends his baseball bat is a sword. Right. And and, bec- and the narrative of the game, like there's different classes and each class works differently and has special moves and has different stats. And then the narrative of the game is also very different. Uh, and I don't think uh, any other previous Yakuza games or any game like that had it, I, as far as I can recall, which is Ichiban believes that he, since he plays so many video games, he sees his opponents as video game monsters. <laughs> Mm. And because of that, uh, these guys transform when they come in front of you in the turn-based RPG style, and it fits into the narrative. This is something that I believe Total Biscuit used to talk about a lot, which is pseudo-narrative dissonance, Mm. which is basically the gameplay doing something, and then 
the story doing something else right uh, to give you good idea imagine a game where you kill thousands of peer fodder and then go to the bad guy and be like oh i can't kill you because you know you are my friend so i will spare you but it it kind of breaks the story breaks when you think about how you just killed thousand people before in here i i felt like they they managed to keep that out because technically you're not killing anyone here first of all in this game it's a hand to hand fighting you're bashing people's head in with a <laughs> baseball bat but even that you can say that you know it's imagination in ichiban's head if nothing else right uh because of how they do because later on in the game you're literally spamming electricity and orbital lasers mm. and uh, yeah things that, like there's a special move called the hum- essence of human face grating mm-hmm. in one of the class where you bring out a big grater and then t- take someone's head and like rub it in that grater to damage mm-hmm. them it's like it's like very weird game but oh my god it's great and the best part I, about the game is that there's a pokemon index mm-hmm. so all the characters you fight in the game basically turn up in that pokemon thing where you can see their stats and they like have this animation where they're moving like this <laughs> and yeah for anyone i would there i would definitely suggest so playing dragon quest, so dragon quest also had some of that the old one of those yeah dragon yeah yeah it's basically it felt like it took everything out from pokemon dragon quest they they mm-hmm. saw all of these tropes uh and and this and in or in on top of all of the ridiculousness and fun and stuff there's a actual very serious storyline going on where mm-hmm. it's a racks to riches story plus a naruto and sasuke story which i won't spoil you will probably get uh, the hint from the beginning if i say it's naruto and sasuke but i will say that it definitely has a better closure than actual naruto right it's it's is the the ending made me feel like yeah it's a nice game right it mm-hmm. it didn't make me want to flip my table unlike some of the other games i played over the years so yeah <laughs> it's it's if you haven't played uh yakuza 7 and you guys are looking for a good rpg jrpg open world game this is it there is a mario kart level in the game where you <laughs> throw bazookas at people to make them make their mario karts go they damage mm-hmm. them so yeah i i this has everything there's a game where you it's there's a mini game where you have to watch a movie and the mini game is about not falling asleep and there are sheep <laughs> there are men there are men with sheep heads doing this in front of you <laughs> like literally this is i'm not even joking and you have to press the button to like squat them mm-hmm. away And uh, yeah yeah this game i can't serious yeah. that's right up my alley dude this yeah. game is so right up my alley i love it yeah, yeah. rishi uh, you played uh, yakuza 7 what are your thoughts is, yeah yeah how come it's so not it's in top 3 so so yeah uh, it's not my so yakuza like a dragon or as it's known in the west is not in my top 3 simply because uh there are a couple of sections in the game where you will have to grind to get through yeah and uh, i i felt that uh, that kind of balancing should have been sorted to begin with True. uh and i mean let's be honest uh, that to me is what really cheesed me off and one or two boss fights at the end unless you have a uh, i think what it's called the sacred stone unless you have that mm. or if you unless your stats are high enough to prevent uh you know getting one hit killed which is possible to, uh, in the final encounters it becomes a little rough So that's why it's not my top three. It's my top five for sure, but not my top three. Yeah. But, but what I you... love about this is it has an Edgar Wright style zaniness, where you know the plot has been exaggerated. Like video gives me a Scott Pilgrim versus uh, the World vibe, and the reason I think largely this game works is because of Ichiban, uh, who I uh, when he said about Naruto, right? I was like, yep. Yeah, in my first year itself, I told this is a Naruto story, and I think why it works is because you always root for characters where. there's a sense of genuineness and they're starting off one foot behind everybody else uh, ichiban for the longest time in the in the first 3 hours i played he's kind of come across as a, a people pleaser and a bootlicker and stuff like that normally that would turn you off but it comes from such a genuine place right it's not that he's trying to cry, climb up higher in the rank mm. the back story that they tell is that he genuinely cares for these people he looks yeah. up to them right when mm. you add that effort 
you are automatically invested in the character and when you are invested into the protagonist half the job is done for a game right like you when you want that protagonist to just get better because the entire game is about the progression of a protagonist rpgs are that right so mm-hmm. when you are when you're completely bought into the idea that i want i want to see this guy grow as a jrpg you've sort of succeeded right there those were my first three hour impression like you've sold me on this character yeah, this yeah. game is this is i'm completely invested yeah and and i haven't played persona 5 but i've seen enough gameplay of it and i i thought uh, correct me because both udit and rishi has played like is the uh, turn based system similar to that um no it's, it's I, i mean on a macro level yeah they kind of similar but i mean in the sense that you're going to you're going to keep trying to figure out who your what your enemy's weaknesses are so that's hmm. i mean yeah that's a part of it but i feel that uh, yakuza has the edge simply because it's a, it's presented in a fashion that's a lot more uh, i mean a lot more visceral a lot more a lot more a lot more realistic and true to life in right. my opinion yeah, so, so that's why over the top with it yeah hmm. yeah. yeah i i get to beat up otaku people in the game so i'm i'm so yeah <laughs> But yeah, thanks for. Uh, I think that's about it for the day. Uh, if you guys haven't played Yakuza Seven or the games that these guys have mentioned, check them out. Um, you can follow Rishi on Twitter, specifically anywhere else, Rishi. Uh, mainly Twitter at Rishi Alwani. So right, yeah. So you can follow Rishi over at Twitter. You can follow IG in India at IG in India. Just Google. Um, but IG and for- <laughs> underscore in on Twitter and <laughs> in dot IG and dot com. Right. I I'll, I'll give those links in the description below for all of you guys to check sure. out and thanks for joining us thanks for joining us for the podcast Rishi it was very nice to have you here some day I will get you and Archie on board so you guys can run together I will just have fun watching that <laughs> but yeah it was fun I hope you also enjoyed um this podcast thanks for having me man yeah Anyway, thanks for watching guys. Uh stay tuned. Uh next Tuesday we are coming back with another another episode. So watch us then. Thanks. Bye bye.